of everything to give you praise it's why i sing no other name is like your name yesterday today and forever the same and you deserve the highest praise you conquered death and rose from the grave jesus you about how you heal the man with the withered hand open blinded eyes made lame walk again the miracle there is no doubt is how you cleanse my soul from every sinful stain I've been born again and I proclaim you are Lord South Ashburn Church of God. It's good to have you in the Lord's house today. It's, it's a wonderful day to come and worship Him. He give us a beautiful day outside. Have that beautiful day inside if we'll just give before the Lord and ask Him to worship. I'm going to ask the ushers they will come on and receive our penny mark at this time. As soon as I get through with that, we'll go ahead and do the Sunday school offering. So it's good to have everyone that's watching online. You know, God's been good to us. Yes. We've had three great weeks of services here for see people saved and one to the kingdom of God. I thought this morning, man, that could be just the start of a good revival. Yeah. Uh, we got one coming up in August, but we can have that revival start before August. Yeah. Brother Bowles not know what he's walking into when he walks in the house of God. You'd like to be turning in your Bible, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Most of the time I try not to get too much reading to begin with. I've got 
Bible I want to read during the Sunday school lesson, but we've got to write smart this morning. I want to, want to read if you can put up with me for just a few minutes. I'm going to ask first that we have prayer, so let's all pray together. Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being in the house of God today. Dear Lord, we thank you for all you're doing in the midst, dear Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to come and worship you again, dear Lord, and lift you up in praise, dear Lord. Lord, we ask you to touch and bless each and every one that's here today, dear Lord. Touch those that's watching online, dear Lord. Lord, we ask you to touch, dear Lord, and anointed, dear Lord, to teach us a lesson, dear Lord. Lord, you'll be praised in what we do, dear Lord. Lord, we ask you to touch those that can't be here today, dear Lord. You know the reason why, dear Lord, sickness, dear Lord. We ask you to touch and heal, dear Lord. Lord, if they had a kind of slowness, Lord, let them see the need to be in the house of God while the doors is open, dear Lord. God in directing everything said and done, dear Lord, and we give you praise for what you're going to do, dear Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, Paul kind of give us a little outline here in Ephesians 6, starting at verse 1 on how we should live our life and things that we should do. And I was looking this morning, wondering where all of our young people's at this morning in the house of God. We don't see them, but it said, Children, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, that you may, that it may be well with thee, and thou must live long upon the earth. Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up and nurture them in the ammunition of the Lord. He starts out by telling us how we should live our life as children. We should show honor and obedience to our fathers and our mothers. And our fathers, you know, we shouldn't just try to rule over children, but show honor and love to them, too, at the same time. Teach them, bring them up in the Lord. You know, I think, you know, the children don't show honor to the fathers and the mothers as they used to. You know, you go to Walmart or a store, and you see children being disobedient to the fathers and the mothers, the way they talk back to them. When I was growing up, you know, you didn't talk back but one time, and you learned never to talk back anymore. Okay. Yeah. But today, you know, people have got to listen to the man rather than God. God said you used the rod of correction on the children. But then man come up and said, no, this is going to break their spirit and this is going to harm them. You can't do that. Or rather than listen to the word of God, they decided to listen to man. Since they listen to the man, now the children don't obey parents. We have to have policemen in the schoolhouse to protect them. And I thought, you know, that just shows us one thing at the end of time is drawing closer because in 2 Timothy, he tells us in the end time, there'll be disobedience to parents. And I said, that's just one more sign he's showing us that's going to be happening for that end time. And he said, goes on to tell us how we should live our life as servants. Now, you may say, well, this is slaves and masters, but I think it's the way before we work in our jobs too. He says, servants. Be obedient to them that are masters according to the flesh, and fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as man pleasers, but as service to Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, doing service as the Lord and not to man. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth shall be received of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And you masters do the same to them that forbear, threatening, knowing, knowing that your master also in heaven neither is our respect of persons. He tells us how we respect our masters, those that have rule over us, to show them respect, show them our Christian life. You know, what does your boss man think of you if you don't show that Christian life yet you show you're a Christian? There's so many today that it seems like once they walk out the church door, everything changes. They're no longer Christian. They go to work. They have a temper. They flare up over everything. And they look at them and say, well, what kind of Christian is this? You know, I told the Sunday school class one time, I once worked with a, a boy. And, well, I worked with several boys. But one of them's in there. He claimed to be a Christian. He talked about it all the time. But he didn't have that Christian life. He had an attitude that was really was terrible and rotten. He didn't care what he'd done. His, his God was money. Whatever he can get off of it, he cheated you to get it. That was all right. But he was still a Christian. 
So one day his pastor came into church uh, in the shop, and he invited the boy that was beside him. He said, won't you come be with us in church? And he said, does so-and-so go to your church? He said, yes, he does. He said, well, if he's going to make it into heaven, I ain't got nothing to worry about. And I said, that, that's the life a lot of Christians live today before others. Right. We should let our people to work with see God in our life and the life that we live. You know, the best way to let them see God in our life is to live that Christian life before them. Paul says, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may withstand the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, rulers of darkness in this world, spiritual weaknesses in high places. Therefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand and withstand an evil that is done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins glory with the truth and having on the breastplates of righteousness and your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Taking, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherein you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always in all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching thereunto with all preservation and supplication with all the saints. And for me that utter giveth unto me that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mysteries of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that wherein I have spoke boldly as I ought to speak. Paul was telling us how we should live as Christians, the life that we should show and the example we should be. He tells us that we should put on the whole armor of God. So often people think, well, you, I get saved and everything's just fine. But we need to go on with the salvation, get the Holy Ghost applied to our life. If we got that Holy Ghost going with us, he'll help us overcome the temptations and the trials of this world and lead us. He said we have to have that faith in our life to go forth and know that God's going to protect us and watch over us and we're going to meet our needs no matter what comes our way. Paul kind of gives us an idea how we're supposed to live our Christian life and let our light shine. He said let your light shine before men that they may see your heavenly Father in you. And glorify God. So we're supposed to let our light shine before the people we work with and the life we live, our children. They should see God in our life. It makes me feel good sometimes when you talk to somebody and they talk about their father or their mother or their grandfather. I told you what, I went to visit one day and the man talked about his grandfather. He said, if anybody went to heaven, my grandfather did. He talked about how his grandfather read the Bible and prayed with him as young boys and all, but he never said nothing about his mother or father. And I always wondered, you know, how he was brought up. All he talked about was his grandfather, how good a Christian he was. But I want somebody to be able to say that about me, you know, that they could see Christ in my walk and the way I talked and the way I did. And that's the life that we should live. But, you know, the devil's going to do everything he can to tear our life up and to bring us down. And that was the title, kind of what my lesson goes on the thing today. It says seven things the devil does not want us to do. And when I said seven things, my wife said, you ain't going to get done. You might as well just forget about it. But, you know, the devil don't want us to go to church. He don't want us to hear the word of God preached. And, you know, you can know that, but you look at the compromising churches out here today. That's compromised the word of God. Pastor's talked about it before. You've got to take this whole Bible. You might step on some toes, hurt some feelings, right. but if it's in the Word of God, it's got to be preached. Right. The people's got to know. I told you I had one preacher told me one day, he said, my job is to get them saved. It's God's job to clean them up. But, you know, if you don't tell them, how are they going to know? Right. But I think we've got a pastor who stands up here and preaches the Word. Right. I told one lady one day, I said, he was, she was talking about how he was preaching at her, and I said, well, he was preaching that way before you came, and he'll be preaching that way when you leave. I said, that's the way he preaches. I said, he preaches the Bible. If it's in the Bible, he's going to preach it. But God don't want us to go to church and hear the word preached. He'd rather for us to go to compromise in church. He'd rather for us to forget about it. He wants us to go to, don't want us to go to church because the Holy Ghost convicts in the church. Now, I thank God in the last three weeks we've seen the Holy Ghost conviction fall in this church. 
We've seen people come in and give their hearts to God, come to this altar, and tears flow. We've seen life's change by what God can do. The conviction's still in the house of God today. A fellow once told me, he said, used to you go to church of God and you felt conviction when you walked in the door. Today, he said, you don't feel nothing. Because the devil has departed from so many churches, Inkle Bob might be able to wrote over the door. It don't matter if it says Church of God or First Baptist or Methodist Church. If they're not teaching the Word of God and preaching the truth, then Inkle Bob should be over the door. Because we have to preach the Word of God. You know, we need to go to church because we can't need encouragement. You know, the devil don't want us to be encouraged. But I like to come to church so I can be encouraged in the Lord. Sometimes you get down and out, and your brother or sister don't have to know what you're down and out about, but just coming in the house of God, it encourages you. It encourages you because somebody's there. You can look at this and over here worshiping God and say, you know, that, that's just encouraging. I, I like the way they worship. I like the way they live for God. It encourages you. Sometimes you get down and out, and you need that little pep to build you up. I told him, I said, you know, the pastor needs that little pep too. Sometimes it feels good to go by and pat him on the back. So you've done a good job today, Pastor. You know, everybody needs encouragement. The teachers need encouragement. We all need to be encouraged before God. And when you go to work, feel, church feeling down and out, it's wonderful to be encouraged. But you know, sometimes you say, well, I don't know how to encourage nobody. Just being in the house of God might be enough. They got to be looking at your life. You're the one that might be setting an example for them, but they don't know it. I think sometimes when I get discouraged, I think about the old saints of God when I was a boy growing up. Some of them serving God and how they'd get in church and worship and praise God. And I said, I want to be a Christian just like him. I want to feel that power. I want to praise God like that. They didn't know they were setting an example for me as I got older. But I still think about that when I get discouraged and down and out sometimes. I think of this old saint of God and how he used to worship God. How he served and he encouraged me. But the devil don't want us to go to church to be encouraged. He don't mind that we're down and out. You know, Hebrews 10, 25 says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as a man or some men, but exhorting one another, even so more as you see that day approaching. You know, no matter who you talk to and what denomination, you talk to them and they'll tell you, you know, it can't continue like this. I believe things, something has got to happen. The Lord's coming back soon. But if that's the case and we really believe that, if everybody says, I think Jesus is coming soon, really believe Jesus is coming soon, we'll be hunting for a place to sit on these pews today. They wouldn't be a church pew in to nowhere. Everybody was trying to get in the house of God. There's something wrong when 85% of the Christians, people say they're Christians, but then you check the people that go to church, they say only 20% of the so-called Christians go to church. Well, something's wrong there because, you know, if 85% of Christians, they would want to be in the house of God. They shouldn't be satisfied with sitting home watching it on TV. You know, I thought a lot of times, you know, when we was out here because of this virus, I told the pastor, I said, watching it on TV ain't the same. I can sit there and look at it on TV, but the spirit just not there like it is in the house of God. God's in that house, and you can feel the power of God. You sit there and watch it on TV. Say, I'm watching the service on television. It ain't a bit of trouble to get up and run to the bathroom while the preacher's preaching. It ain't no trouble to run away, so I'm going to get me a, something to drink right quick. Or laying back in our recliner at ease. Just taking it easy, you know. Feet to you. We need to be in the house of God. If you're a child of God, you need to be in the house of God. You know, it's, it's not enough that I watch it online. We should have a desire to be in this house. Even more so as we see that day approaching. As we see that day approaching, there's not no time for us to start calling off Sunday night service. No time for us to call off Wednesday night service. The pastor told you, I, I told him one time it bothered me when I was sitting at home on Wednesday nights and not coming to church. You know, we used to have church on Tuesday night. Everybody around me had church on Wednesday night, except us, and we had it on Tuesday night. Well, they didn't all know that I had went to church on Tuesday night, and I said, bother me. People going by my house, seeing my car in the carport, so I thought he was a Christian. He don't ever go to church on Wednesday night. And that bothered me. I wonder what people are thinking of me. But they, they didn't know I'd been on Tuesday night, but I want them to know I was in the house of God and the door was open. 
when he changed that service back to Wednesday night, it just tickled me to death. And I said, now people know I'm in church on Tuesday, Wednesday night where I belong. We all belong in the house. Of, oh, Lord. Sister Albright's right. <laughs> we all belong in the house of God. Amen. The devil, he don't want us to pray. The devil don't want us to pray because that prayer brings power. That prayer brings consecration, a dedication to him, a dedication to that Christian life. And prayer brings victory. You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, you doubt when you pray if you just keep praying for the same old thing. Just pray and let it go. God will answer prayer. You know, you're not sure of no faith. But then I think of old Daniel when he prayed for 21 days. It was the same thing. I said, he didn't just pray one time and walk off and say, well, God will do it or God won't do it. And look at Elijah when he prayed for the rain. He just seen the great hand of God pray right down when he burnt that offering and against Baal. And then he went up there to pray for rain. He then told the king Ahab, he said, get on down for I hear the abundance of rain. He sent his servant. He said, you go out there and look. And he got down on his hands and knees. And no doubt, you know, Elijah, he was a man that could reach God. We'd seen him raise people from the dead and heal people. But he went to praying, and he prayed that God to send that cloud. He told the servant, he said, you come let me know what you see. And the servant come back and said, I don't see nothing. He, everything's like it was. He said, go back and look again. He didn't stop praying. He went praying. He'd done this seven times. He didn't give up. He kept praying. And the seventh time, he said, I see a cloud as a man's hand. And I just knew that he just kept on. God was going to hear, and God was going to answer prayer. Hear, hear, and answer our prayer. We just pray and be abundant with him. You know, sometimes I said we need to pray without ceasing. I said that the other Sunday. But you say, well, how can I do that? You can always have that prayer in your heart. No matter what you're doing, you can be driving down the road. You can be at work. But just give God praise there once a while. Don't hurt to raise that hand or say, Lord, go with me. Lord, Lord, I want to praise you for what you've done for us. We've got so much to praise him for. We say, well, I, I don't know, you know, but still we got a lot to praise God for, and we don't have to just do it when we get in the house of God. I think anymore a lot of people have got where they just pray in the house of God. The rest of the week, God don't know who they are, and yet when they pray, they expect God to answer their prayer. And, you know, you see, kind of like the man that was with de that possessed with demons. He said, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, but who are you? Sometimes I think Jesus tells us that because we haven't communicated with him enough where he knows who we are. We have to draw close to God. You know, the devil tries to hinder us from witnessing. He don't want us to go out and witness for him. You know, a lot of people tell you, well, I don't know what to say, you know. What do I say to somebody if I knock on the door? Well, I guarantee you, if somebody opens that door and looks at you, you'll find something. You ain't going to just stand there. God will give you something to say. You know, I never work out a speech when I go to knock on somebody's door or the witness of somebody. I said, God always gives you something to say if you put your faith in him. Say, Lord, help me. You know, God likes to hinder our witnessing. He don't want us to witness to others. You say, well, you know, how they hinder a witness? Well, we started a witnessing program here in the church here, I don't know, a year ago, two years ago on Saturday. And, boy, it started out good. We had like 15 or 20 people. Show up, they're going to go out and witness, knock on doors, bring people to church. Gradually it dwindled down, the devil took the people away. Gradually they said, well, I'll just pray at home, or I'll witness here at home. You wonder if they're really going out knocking on any doors or not. Then it finally dwindled down, what was it, six or seven to show up, to go out and knock on doors. The devil has hindered our walk before God. We have to go forth. We can't be held up. The devil wants us to make an excuse to stay at home. He wants us to stay at home. But we have to go out and knock on that door and invite people into the house of God. We like to say, you know, how God adds to the church daily, but he expects us to put legs on that work in our part too. If we don't do our part, how can we pray that he does his part? We have to draw closer to God and go out and witness for him. You never know what your testimony might do. You know, I said, well, I don't know what that would testify to people, what God has done for you. Sometimes that little testimony is all it's going to take. You know, 
A lot of us lived a wicked life when we was young. You might not have killed nobody or anything, but you wasn't serving God. You might have had a foul mouth. You might have drunk. You might have took dope, smoked. We don't know what each one of us done. But God delivered us from a lot. And we got a lot to testify for what God has done for us. You know, the woman at the well, and Jesus left to go into Galilee, and he told the disciples, I need to go to Samaria. This woman come out to draw water. Jesus was sitting out the well resting while his disciples went and bought food. Jesus got to talking to her, and she perceived that he was a prophet. Jesus said, go bring your husband. See, Jesus didn't condemn her right off. He was just talking to her. Sometimes we're just talking to somebody can lead right on to what we need. And then she told him, said, well, I have no husband, Lord. Jesus said, right, you said you, you don't have a husband. You've had five, but the one you're living with now is not your husband. You know, all she had to do was open that door a little bit, and Jesus seen to open it and went through you know, this woman, you say, well, he witnessed this woman but at the well. But that started a revival in Samaria. Jesus ended up staying there two days, preaching to the people, and said many was one to the kingdom of God because of what he said, his word. Because of this woman that was out there in sin, once Jesus had touched your heart, she wouldn't tell the others. Hit one out. That's kind of what I don't understand about us as seniors and elders. Now, you may say, well, I'm not an elder, but you may be an elder in Christ even though you're not old today. But you get a young Christian, and he gets saved. He's going to go tell somebody. And the first thing you know, I see more young Christians when they get saved bringing people into the house of God. They want to get this person to know what they got. And finally, when we get old, we kind of go accustomed to walking and whatsoever, let the young ones do it. But it's our job to go out and testify to people and tell them what God has done for us, to bring them into the house of God. We have to witness for him. The devil don't want us to witness for him. He wants us to go forward and just be a, I, I'm going to say a bench warmer, come in on Sunday, sit down on the bench, and go back home. But that young child of God, he's got a burn in his heart to go out. He's got a burning for the word of God. I told him, I remember when I first got saved, I believe I could have sat on that pew all day long and never left. Man, I was just eating the word up. I wanted it. I just hated for the pastor to dismiss, so I had to go home. Couldn't wait for Sunday night to get back. And I said, then Wednesday, was, come Wednesday, it seemed like it was going to be forever. That was eternity getting Wednesday to come here so I could hear the word of God again. And today, people don't seem to care about hearing the word of God. You can't half get them in on Sunday morning. Can't get part of that crowd on Sunday night. Can't get them come back on Wednesday. Like the pastor said, I guess I preached too good on Sunday morning. But you know, you wonder what's wrong with people that don't want to be in the house of God. Like the pastor said, they don't want to go to his house. Why in the world they want to go to his home? People today can't be a Christian sitting at home watching on TV. They're not getting the house to encourage their brothers and sisters. They're not getting encouraged in the word. You know, the old saying was, don't just talk to talk, but walk to walk. Right. Right. We have to get in the house of God and let our light shine before others. We can't just talk about being a Christian. We have to let that light shine before others. Why would somebody want something if we, all we do is complain and don't have that light? You know, how can you live in a world of sin and go out and witness somebody else and expect them to be in the house of God? If you got that fire burning in you, I guarantee it's going to touch somebody else. Right. It's just like an old forest fire, I told you. Up on Gatlinburg when they had it. Where the fire started at, and that thing had got burned all over the place, a different place, where a little spark could hit here, and a little spark could hit there, and a little flame would fly up. Well, that's where you are, a child of God. You get on fire for God, and that's why I pray a lot of times, send the Holy Ghost, send the fire, God. We need that fire back in the house of God. That little spark could hit over here. First thing you know, a little fire will start kindling there and the spark will hit over here. And the little fire gets going there and the spark will pop over here on this side. You know, that's the way a child of God should be, be on fire for God. And that seems like when the Holy Ghost falls, it don't ever fall in one spot. It might kind of fall down there to start off with and then it just kind of rolls off into somewhere else. And it keeps going in the house of God. Yeah. That Holy Ghost fire spread. You're not going to sit down. 
You know, on the day of Pentecost, it says they were filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. When that fire got kindled on the day of Pentecost, they went out in the town. Said there's 3,000 souls saved that day. They could have stayed up in the upper room speaking in tongues and nothing would have been done. But when they went out and that fire got kindled and went out to the people, souls was one to the kingdom of God. We'll get back on fire again like that day of Pentecost. You know, the pastor talked about he wanted us to be like that church in Pentecost. You know, if we get on fire like that church in Pentecost and we leave out of here, we're going to be on fire. Well, we want more to tell somebody what Jesus has done for us. We're going to want to get them in the house of God. You know, if you don't get nobody else in the house, get your family in the house of God. I know i got family that's lost. I said sometimes I think the devil's got a chain around them. When Sister Ashley and, sing, and the youth sing that song, I hear the chains falling. That's what always pops in my mind, my children. I wish them chains would fall. So I, the devil's got them in such a bind. I won't see them in the house of God. But to get them in the house of God, i got to live the part. If they come in, they say, I'm not living the part when I'm not in the house of God. They're not going to be here. But that, he's in us when we're out of the house of God. Then we're going to be a testimony with them. I pray a lot of times, God, let my house be a house of conviction. I want to feel conviction when they come in my house. I want to know that God lives in that house. Maybe that's the reason they don't want to come see it. It kind of bothers you sometimes. Sister Blanks told me that one day. I was talking about I want my house to be a couch. She said, well, maybe that's the reason they don't want to come. Maybe they feel convicted when they come. Well, if it is, praise the Lord. I'm just going to keep praying for them and keep praying for conviction to be on them. Well, you know, that Lord's going to come soon. It ain't going to be long. And he's going to call his church home. I want to be ready to go. You know, I was at the dump in Moore County a few weeks ago, and the man working the dump, he's going to have a birthday in three months. But he come over talking to me. He says, what do you think? Do you think we're living in the end time? I said, yes, I do. I said, I think he could come any day now. He said, I do too. He's the same age as I am, 69. He said, in three months, I'm going to be 70. But he said, I don't believe I'm going to ever be 70. He said, I believe the Lord will come for my three months is up. He said, I'm looking forward to it. You know, praise God, that's the way we all be. We should be able to pray as John prayed, even so come, Lord Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, i, I got to stop. I'm going to go on. I, I think i give you three out of seven. Sister Albright was right. But, <laughs> but we... We really appreciate you being in the house of God today. The example you set. It looks good when people rise by and see the parking lot full of cars. They said them people love God. So we appreciate you being in the house of God today. We appreciate your attention during the lesson. Let's continue to worship God through the house of God and let our light shine before others. Thank you. Well, there's a feeling in the air that God is everywhere and His resurrection power is moving in this hour that Jesus might be glorified. Well, there's a feeling in the air that God is everywhere and His resurrection power is moving in this hour that Jesus might be Glorify the name of the Lord. 
will glorify his name. Oh, I will Welcome to South Asheboro Church of God. So glad you decided to join us today, either here in the sanctuary or online. Good to see uh, Joyce and Billy and those grandbabies back there, Dale and Diane, Mike. Good to have all of all of our home folks. We're glad to have you here. Praise God. Uh, God's been good to us. Uh, he, he's a mighty big God. Uh, let's go ahead and do our children's $2 drawing. Go ahead and get that. Bring them up and I'll give them two dollars. How's that? How about they come up and I'll give them two dollars? Them two little girls come up there. Two of them there? Bring them two little girls up here. Praise God. Praise 
Praise God. You know, we've got a lot to pray about. I was looking at my list, and my list is just you know, about full. I had to write on the side. We've got so many prayer requests. But, you know, we've got a great big God, and God wants us to bring our needs into him. As we pray, let's can pray for Nathan, Brianna, and uh, Kaylee. Kaylee's at urgent care this morning. But pray for that little baby. Say she's having a problem breathing. God's able to reach down and touch her. Brother Dean was sharing with me right before church. He said he hurt his hand the other day at work. He said he was getting up on the car and said he hurt his hand. He said it just hurts bad. He said he, told, he, said he thought it started swelling up and everything. He said, Lord, he said, I can go to the doctor and have this checked out or you can take care of it right now. He said there was no time at all that pain was gone. The swelling was gone. He was healed instantaneously. That's our God. He's still answering prayer today. Praise God. Let's uh, continue praying for Daniel Christian and uh, uh, Josiah all, and all of Christian Bowden's family. Uh, the funeral is going to be today. Remember that family. Pray for her sister Judy Lucas and her daughter that's in California. She's spending some time with her. Uh, continue to pray for Sister Tracy who has shingles. Uh, pray for Sister Ashley, Sister Andrea, Sister Becky Tig as they carry their babies full term. Pray for the new converts, Mike, Jason, and Jessica. You know, we need to lift our new converts up. Encourage them in the Lord. Pray for Haley. She had a sore throat this morning. Pray for Lillian, Sister Garen's sister. Uh, she's in urgent care of need. So pray for Sister Garen's sister, Lillian. Uh, continue praying for Myra Brady. She needs a touch from the Lord. Pray for uh, Sister Tina. She's not feeling well. Good to have Brother Zach back. He's, he hasn't been feeling well, but I'm glad he's back. Uh, pray for uh, Lee Wells. He needs healing. Uh, he had a major stroke, but he also needs spiritual help. Also pray for Sister Amy's job situation that God will just work things out for her, her good and his glory. And we pray for Brother Benny's wife, Sandra. She's recovering from the knee surgery and doing well. Let's praise God for that. Has anybody else got a prayer request? Okay. Let's stand and go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, we come to you again today, Lord God. We're thanking you, we're praising you, Lord God. We're touching Brother Dean and healing his hands. And Lord, just like you healed his hand, Lord God, you can reach down this morning, Lord God. Touch these knees, Lord God. You've heard each and every one of them, Lord God. Lord, I ask God you just touch this thing, this job situation, Lord God. Touch Brother Dean's wife, Sandra, Lord, heal her knees. Lord, I ask God you just touch Lord, each and every one of them, touch this thing, Lord God. Deliver from these shingles, Lord God. Lord, I ask God you just touch Lord God's hands, Lord God. this morning Thank brother albright brought uh, you know the reason the church is not like it used to be it's called we changed god has not changed if we want we can have we can just get as close to god as we want to get to him and if we want and that should be our heart's desire just draw closer and closer to him because he's coming soon and we better be close to him i'd hate to come up to the last minute and miss out with god <clears throat> i want to speak on just a minute lay aside every weight in the sin the Apostle Paul to the Hebrews, 
Hebrews 12 and 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, lay us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You know, there's a race set before us as we're becoming ch children of God. Right. We've got to run this race. We can't be slack. We can't be, just, well, I'm just going to sit down and rest a while. No, there's a race, and we've got to stay in that race. And if we stay in that race, we can say what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4 and 7 when we come to the end of our life. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Let us keep the faith. Let's continue to, to fight uh, the good fight of faith. Praise God. This time I have Sister Amy come and lead us in a congregational. stand with me this morning let's stand together you know we make a lot of plans we make a lot of plans in this life we all have plans today for different things got plans to go home and cook and do all that stuff but above all my plans I plan to leave this world I plan to fly away one day let's sing about that this morning hope you do too some glad morning fly away. Praise God. This time we're going to continue with worship and receive our tithes and offering and get our ushers coming at this time. Praise the Lord. The Bible said the Lord loveth the cheerful giver. And one way he says if you want to give, says take your wallet hand it to the person beside you and tell them just give out of it. Praise God. Brother Zach, would you pray over this time of worship? There is no
God. Amen. May God richly bless you for your faithfulness and giving. This time we'll have Sister Amy come and uh, minister in song. He's getting ready, bless him. We didn't tell him what we were doing. <laughs> While he's getting ready, I just want to brag on the Lord and thank him for saving me, yeah. for sanctifying me, for filling me with the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful yeah. that I'm not what I used to be. Yeah. Um, he's brought us a mighty long way, and I, I can't make it without him. I know you feel the same way. I can't make it without him. I love him, and I thank him for his saving power. Yeah. Amen. Thank, God. thank you, Lord. God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. He is Lord of all humanity, and he rules by his word. He is king of all the ages, the first and the last. I'm his child by mercy, forgiven from my sinful past. a dying Savior, bruised, shamed, and despised. He is the great Redeemer, giving victory in life. He is the risen conqueror, setting my captive spirit free. And I love him, yes, I love him, because he first
Jesusly saved. Praise God. The greatest miracle that's ever happened to each of us is when we got saved. Greatest miracle of all. Praise God. This time I'm going to turn the service to our pastor, Brother Shelton. Amen. Thank you, Brother Shelton. Let's give God a hand of praise this morning because we're gloriously and miraculously saved. I'm so glad for the work of God in our lives. Nobody, nobody can explain it to anyone else to a place where they can understand it until it happens to them. You can tell people how wonderful it is to be saved, what a wonderful thing God's done, but until a man knows that for himself, they don't understand. I'm so glad for the souls saved here on Wednesday night. We want to pray for Jason and Jessica. They live a good ways from here, and uh, we pray they'll be able to come up to this church. If they can't come up here, they'll find a good church down there where they live. There's other good churches. They're not all liberal. A lot of them are, but there's still some good conservative churches across the land today. And uh, somebody said, well, I, you know, I think both kinds all right. Boy, I don't want to start out like this. But this book is a conservative book. This way is a conservative way. It is not a liberal way. It's not a loose way. Can you prove that I can? Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. Few there be that find it. I want to be in that straight and narrow way, don't you? But there's still some great straight and narrow way churches. And uh, we want to pray they'll find a God. I'd love them to come up here. I know they have a long way to come. Let's pray for them. And uh, I, I tell you, I, I'm still celebrating. I'm still rejoicing over what happened to Brother Mike a few Sunday nights ago. Ever, listen, if you have talked to me since that Sunday night, whoever you are that I've come in contact with, you know Brother Mike got saved on that Sunday night. I've told everybody. I mean, it was like I got saved all over again. And to see him back there this morning with his hand raised, praising God, tears running down his face. Oh, God, help us not to ever lose that feeling, the joy of salvation, the joy of serving the Lord. Knowing where God brought us from. Can you say praise the Lord? We're glad to see you on the Lord's house on the Lord's day. And I agree 100% with Brother Albright. I believe that you ought to be in church if you're a Christian. It, it, you know, it becomes a habit sometimes of just missing. It gets easy to miss if you get into the habit of missing. Somebody said, well, I'm just going to watch online but if you can be in God's house, I think you ought to be in God's house. The online services at different churches across the land. There, we don't do that so that you can just be convenient for you to stay home, stay in your pajamas and watch church on TV. We do that for people who are sick, for people who are shut in, for people who are lost. Is that right? It's not for the home folks. Oh, come on, say amen to me. Now, I'm not going to preach that, but I will. We ought to be in church. We ought to have a desire to be in church. I believe if you don't have a desire to go to this house, you don't have a desire to go to this home. If you don't go to this house here, how can you go to this home over there? Moms and dads, if you'll keep that little girl in church, you might keep her out of the backseat of a boy's car. Is that too sharp, Sister Shelton? Where's she at? I said, if you'll keep that girl in God's house like you're supposed to, you might keep her out of the back of that boy's car. If you keep those boys in church like they ought to be raised in church, you'll keep them out of that drug den. We're going to raise our kids in the house of God and teach them, not just in what we say, but in how we live and what we do. I believe raising them in the house of God. I, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for a mom and dad that raised me in church. I'm glad. I didn't appreciate it back then, but after I got saved, I did. I'm glad they raised me in the house of God to know to go to God's house. I, I know, I, I, you know, as Christians, I just believe Christians go to church. I believe that's our nature. That, that bartender doesn't have to call that alcoholic to say, I'm, are you going to be here on Saturday night on your bar stool? No, he'll be there because that's his nature. Christians go to church because that's their nature. 
They ought to have a desire, and I believe Christians do have a desire to be in God's house. I told Sister Shelton this morning, oh, great God, i got to preach, Brother Scott. I told Sister Shelton this morning I was going to say something about people dragging in late, but I said I'm just not going to say anything about it because I've been saying that for years and years and years, and people keep on doing it. Did you feel that draw up? I felt it draw up. So just keep on doing what you're doing. God bless you. Let's stand for the word of God. 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll preach you happy now. Might have made some of you mad already, but we'll get you happy in just a few minutes. 1 Peter chapter 1. We can read it in verse 6 today. We're glad you're here. We are glad for those watching online. We want to pray for those sick. I've got several sick. I got a bunch of texts this weekend, and uh, people sick. People need prayer, need touch, touches in their body. And uh, people going through things right now, but God is faithful in me. First Peter chapter 1, and we'll read verse 6 and 7. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful this morning. <clears throat> Thankful we can be in church today. Lord, I, I say this often, but it's still true. I know that there are many people that would love to trade places with me right now. There are people that would love to be in the house of God, people that are in hospitals people that are in hospice care and hospice houses now, people that are shut in their homes that cannot get out, Lord. I, I know there's people that would love to trade places with me. And Lord, I count it a tremendous blessing to be able to be in the house of God today, to be able to come to church, to be able to feel your presence, uh, hear good teaching and hear good singing, Lord, to be able to give to the work in the kingdom of God. We pray now as we endeavor to preach uh, You'll help us for the next little while, Lord. I pray there'll be conviction today. Pray that you'll encourage, you'll help people. I pray that you'll draw us to the altar, God. Save the lost. Sanctify, baptize us with the Holy Ghost and fire. Fill us and refill us, Lord. Heal the sick today. Lord, everything that's done, let it be for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. 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 Peter said here in 1 Peter chapter 1, Reading verses 6 and 7 this morning. He said, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. He said that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. The trial of your faith trial, that battle, that test, he said it's more valuable than money. Now, you've got to be spiritually minded to agree with him here. The carnal man said, I'd rather have the money than the trial and the test. But Peter said that the trial of your faith is more precious than silver and gold than money. He said, which perisheth? Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trial of your faith, being more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried or though it be tested with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Can you give him a hand of praise as you're seated this morning? What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Brother Dean, you're doing a great job in the sound booth. Thank you, brother. Give me just a little bit more monitor, and please don't tell Sister Shelton. She told me recently, she said, the reason you can't hear good it's because your monitors are too loud all these years. And I said, my monitors are too loud because I can't hear good. So I'm just stuck. I'm just stuck right where I'm at. It's all right. Amen? So good to see these little girls back here this morning. Glad they brought their granddaughters with them. They're cute little gals. Amen? They were excited about that. I, I know they're girls. They, boy, you saw them. They got that money. They got excited, didn't they? I've never seen a woman didn't get excited about money. Can you say amen? I want to talk to you on this thought today. When your faith is on trial, when your faith is on trial, 
The Apostle Peter said here in our scriptures that I read to you in verse 7, he said that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Peter tells us here a revelation that, again, you have to be spirit-minded to be able to say man with him, that the trials of our life are a very precious thing. I looked up the word precious, and that word precious means in Webster's is defined as uh, something of great value or of high price, highly esteemed uh, or cherished, uh, very valuable or important. Then I looked up the Greek word here for the word precious, uh, and it means beloved or dear or honorable. Now, I, I believe every one of you in this house this morning would agree with me uh, that most of us would never describe the trial of our faith uh, using this same word that Peter did. I've never had anybody come to me and say, Brother Shelton, uh, I just want to praise the Lord for this trial that I'm going through. It is precious. It is valuable to me. Most of the time we say, I need you to pray for me. I'm going through a trial. I'm going through a test. Is that right? Most people wouldn't tell you that the trials that they're facing, uh, that they're dealing with, are precious. When we go through the test, and we go through the trials, and we go through the fire, uh, it does not seem valuable to us at the time. It does not seem like it's something to be cherished uh, or something that is beloved. Matter of fact, most Christian people would tell you uh, that they would rather not have to go through any trial. We'd rather not have to go through any test. If we had our way about it and God said it's your choice, uh, we would always choose the easy road. We'd always choose the mountain tops uh, rather than the trials and the tests and the valleys, uh, the difficulties in this journey. But we know here today that this is not the case for Christians. We realize very early on, I, I said this recently, Brother Mike got saved and I've said this to other young converts, that when you get born again, uh, you might as well go ahead and brace yourself because all of hell is going to come against you. The devil is going to put out all the stumps uh, to try to trip you up early, to try to discourage you, uh, and to try to get you to give up on God. But let me say this to you this morning. Uh, the same God that worked that miracle of salvation uh, in your life is the same God uh, that will keep you safe in this journey uh, if you just walk with Him, if you just love Him, uh, if you live for Him. Uh, the God that saved you is also the God that will keep you secure. Can you shout amen this morning? Amen. We realize very early on from the moment that we're born again, uh, that Christ, this Christian life is one of conflict. It is one of trials and hardships. I've told you before, as Christians, we're not on a love boat. Uh, we're on a battleship here. The Apostle Paul said we are to fight the good fight of faith uh, and lay hold on eternal life. We know that we're to live by faith in Jesus Christ. There's times in this journey uh, that our faith is going to be tried. Our faith is going to be tested. What good is a faith if it cannot be tested? Uh, what good is a faith uh, if it cannot be tried? I'm telling you that our faith is going to be on trial uh, at times as we walk with Jesus Christ. Just as that person there in that court of law sits there uh, and is tried by a judge to test uh, and to see whether they're innocent or if they're guilty, uh, they go to that trial, they sit before that judge uh, so that a decision can be rendered about them. Uh, our faith as well is going to be on trial. Our faith is going to be tried uh, to see if it is a genuine faith, uh, if it is a real faith. I'm telling you, friend, real faith uh, is going to be tested, uh, but real faith can stand the test uh, and the trial. Can you say, praise the Lord today? Amen. This is what happened to Brother Job. 
The Bible said everything's going along well for him. The Bible said that he's perfect before God. That means that he's mature. He's walking right before God. He feared God. He eschewed evil. He abstained from the appearance of evil. But God's going to test this faith of this great man of God. The devil brought everything that he had against Job. Killed his family. Uh, took his wealth from him. Uh, his own wife turned her back on him and said, Why don't you deny God, curse God, and die? Here Job has been smitten with boils, with sickness uh, in his body. His faith is being tried. Uh, his faith is under attack. Uh, but listen to me, friend. When the day was over uh, and when the test was done, when the trial was over, over. God found his faith to be genuine. God found his faith to be true. Job was able to say the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. He said though these old skin worms destroy this old body yet in my flesh I'm going to see God. When his faith was on trial he passed the test and he kept his faith in God and God alone. Can you give him a hand of praise the morning? Hallelujah. Our faith is going to be tried to find out whether our faith is real faith. To find out whether our faith is genuine faith. I want to say this to you right now. If you're here, if you're going through it right now, if you're up against it right now, you say, what's happening to me, Brother Shelton? I'll tell you what's happening. Your faith is being tried. Your faith is on trial. So the question has to be raised, if that's you this morning, will this righteous judge, will God find us faithful? Will God find that our faith is genuine in him? And will we come forth shining like pure gold? I'm telling you, if you've got real saving faith, uh, there's nothing that we're going to face in this life uh, that we cannot trust God uh, to see us through, uh, to help us overcome. The Bible said uh, that we are more than conquerors through him uh, that loved us. Uh, you may lose everything else, uh, but if you can keep your confidence uh, and your faith uh, and your trust in God, uh, we're going to always come for shining like gold on the other side of this trial. Can you shout amen to him today? Hallelujah to God. Our Christianity depends on our faith. If our faith is wanting, then there's nothing else of any spiritual value to us. I said if our faith does not stand firm, if our faith goes uh, to the place where it's lacking or wanting, uh, then nothing about us is spiritually good in the eyes of God. You can dress the part. You can act the part. You can talk the part and play the part. Uh, amen. But if we have no faith, uh, the Bible said we cannot please God. The Bible goes on to say that whatsoever that is not of faith is sin. You don't have to go out and get drunk to sin against God. You don't have to go out and rob somebody to sin against God. You don't have to go out and do something in that world. The Bible said if we don't have faith, it is sin. It is sin. It is sin. But you and I, by the grace of God, have been given a measure of faith. And then the Bible said we're to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. If you can hold on to your faith, you can hold on to God. And you can and overcome. Hallelujah to God. The Bible said, the writer of Hebrews said, in Hebrews 11 and 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Our Christian faith depends on our faith in this great God. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus told the apostle Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to sift thee, to have thee, and to sift thee as wheat. 
In other words, what he's saying here is your faith is going to go on trial. Your faith is going to be tested. Satan's going to try to tread on you. Satan's going to try to press on you. Satan's going to try to discourage you and then destroy you. But Jesus said to him in verse 32, he said, But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. I'm telling you, friend, Jesus here, he did not pray that his shout and worship would not fail. He did not pray that his song would not fail. He did not pray that his church attendance would not fail. But he said that when your faith is tried, when your faith goes on trial, when Satan comes against you, he said, I prayed that your faith, that it will not fail. That Listen to me. That you maintain your trust in God. That you maintain your faith in the Lord of glory. What Jesus is telling Peter here is this that if you can hold on to your faith, if your faith stands strong and can be supported everything else about your Christian walk is going to stand firm. If you can keep your faith in God, amen, you go to church. If you keep your faith in God, you can keep your song. If you can keep your faith in God, you'll keep your shout. You'll still be able to praise. Everything in our Christian walk depends on our faith in God Almighty. Listen, when you go through the trial, if you can trust God, you can get up and go to his house. When you're going through the fire of her, if you can keep your faith in God, you can still raise your hands and say amen. When you're going through the fiery trial, if you can keep your faith in God, you can pray another prayer. You can stay in the Word. It is all dependent upon keeping our faith in God and God alone. Raise your hands and give Him praise today. Didn't say, I'm going to pray that you can keep your shout. I'm going to pray you'll keep going to church. He said, Satan's desired to have you, that he might sift you as wheat. He didn't say, I I'm going to pray that your prayer life doesn't fail. No. He said, I'm praying that your faith holds up. I'm praying that when your faith goes on trial, that you're going to keep your faith in me. You're going to trust in me. I'm telling you, friend, there's folks today out of church, uh, amen, because they lost their faith. There's people that's lost their shout because they've lost their faith. That brother Albright alluded to it this morning, talking to that man who believed the Lord could come before his 70th birthday, before three months' time. He said, I believe the Lord's going to come. The reason people don't feel the house of God anymore. They say, I believe Jesus is coming back, but they don't really believe that. The reason our churches are not full and running over is because there's a lack of faith in this generation. But Jesus said, Simon, when the devil brings his best against you, if you can keep your faith, then you can keep on going forward. And the same is true for us. When the way it gets hard. If you don't want to fall out of church, keep your faith in God. If you don't want to lose your prayer life, keep on believing God. If you don't want to lay it down, keep your faith in God Almighty. Somebody say, man, if our faith can stand strong. It can be supported and everything that goes along with us is going to stand firm. I've watched some of you folks go through hell and back, it seemed like. You never miss church. You never fail to be in the orders. There's a reason for that. There's a reason that, that, that faith in the Lord is stronger than that, that trial that you're going through. We can keep our faith in God. If I can believe Him, if I can trust Him. I'm telling you sometimes, I didn't come to make you mad or be ugly. I'm telling you, sometimes we have more faith in doctors uh, than we do the great physician. Oh, I'm going to say something. I've got to move on today. 
These folks ought to be in church with sickness, letting the saints of God lay their hands on them, then laid up at a hospital begging a doctor to do something for them today. Come on, Sam. I knew you weren't going to respond too well with that. I'm just telling you, sometimes we put more faith and more confidence in a pill bottle, in a doctor because he went to school, than we do the creator of the heavens and the earth, than we do the one that created these bodies, that know how to heal the bodies, the Bible said they be being is sick among you. Let them come before the church that the elders gather around them. Let them anoint them with oil and they shall be healed. I still believe in the healing power of God and God's holy word. Well, say man or say on me today. Sometimes we put more confidence and more faith in a doctor, in a banker, in an accountant, in that school teacher, than we do in God. I'm telling you, they didn't, can't do what God can do. I said they can't do what God can do. I'm not against doctors. I'm not against bankers. I'm not against accountants. I, I'm not against school teachers. I'm telling you, our faith should first and foremost uh, always be in this divine one, uh, this great almighty God. Uh, the church has got to come back uh, and build ourselves up uh, in that kind of faith again. Uh, I may be going through a trial. Uh, I may be facing a difficulty, uh, but God's going to see me through. Uh, God's going to deliver me. Uh, God's going to rescue me. Uh, God's going to heal me. Uh, God's going to help me. Uh, our faith must be in God Almighty. Somebody say amen. Amen. Some folks have got more confidence in men than they do in God. I know, I know people don't like that kind of preaching. But sometimes we bring them to church. They might get healed in church. Y'all better help me up here because they ain't helping me out there, I can tell you right now. Our faith has to stand firm. And if we don't have faith in God, we can do all the religious mechanics. We can have all those things. Uh, and listen to me, and it's not worth of any value to God. We have to live by faith. You know the difference in the old timers and us today? It's not technology. It's not all the changes of the day. I know you look in that world, things are worse today than when, when I was young coming up in school or when I was a young boy, some of you older than I am. Things are different, but you know the real difference today between that older generation, this generation is faith. That older generation, they just believe what this book said. If God said he'd heal, lay hands on them, they'd get better. They just believe that. They brought the sick and God healed them. When they didn't have any money, they didn't have a nervous breakdown and fall apart. They just believe God if he has to. I can go down the riverbank there. Ain't even got to cast it. Got to take my boat out. God will cause a fish to spit money out. At me, I'm just telling They believe that God would do what his word says. In this generation, it seems like it's everything else. And when that don't work, we finally turn to God. But God's got to be first. we got to trust him in the morning, at the noonday, in the midnight hour. Our faith must be in God and God alone. That's the difference between them old saints and this generation today. I just tell you, we don't have faith like that older generation had. They couldn't go to the doctor every time they got a sniffle. Sister Shelton, you better help me here. Now we get a sniffle like that. I can't go to church because I got that little sniffle. But come Monday morning, I don't care if they got a nosebleed, it won't stop. They're going to be on that job. Let me move on. I think I better move on. Faith. Without it, I can't please God. Without it, you can't please God. The Bible said if it's not faith, it's sin. 
You won't go to hell just for sitting on a bar stool. Won't go to hell just for being in a drug house somewhere. Won't go to hell just for adultery and fornication and all those types of sins. Amen. But if we don't live by faith, the Bible said it's sin against God. That's why we need to be in church. That's why we need to pray every day. That's why we need to be in the Bible. That's why we need to cultivate that faith and believe what God's Word says. We ought to walk with God in such a way. If His Word says it, can't no man talk me out of it can't no devil get me to deny it I just simply believe what his word says and I'm going to live by the word of God amen the trials that we face are precious because they always have a way of helping us in the end and we don't always see it at the time you know how we do I told myself I was going to preach a short message today. I'm going to have to cut half of this out. You know how we do when we go through trials? We let it hinder us. We let it stifle our prayer life. I'm already here. I might as well just go ahead and say it. We get down. We get discouraged. We lay out of church. But trials, Peter said, are of more value than all the gold at Fort Knox. Trials are more precious. The test of our faith is of more value than all the money in the bank. Trials are of value uh, because when it's all said and done, uh, we see that God is doing something wonderful in our lives. God is working miracles in our lives. Uh, trials always have a way of helping us. Uh, God does not put our faith on the stand to try us, uh, to hurt us, uh, to hinder us, uh, to discourage us. Uh, amen. But God's working in our lives. Uh, God's trying to get rid of the dross. Uh, God's trying to get rid of the things uh, that hold us back. Uh, God's trying to make us stronger in Him. Uh, trials always have a way of helping us in the journey of serving the Lord. That's why Peter said they're precious when we're put to the test in this life. It's the trials of life that bring us closer to the Lord because in those times God reminds us of the great truths of His Word that we tend to forget when things are easy. When everything's going along smooth, I don't need to praise hard. When everything's going along smooth, I don't have to depend on God as much. God knows exactly when to test us. God knows exactly when to try us because God's trying to do something in us. God's trying to carve out something in us. These trials are precious to us. We're reminded here when we go through the trials and the test uh, that Jesus is always with us. Hebrews 13 and 5 says, For he saith, I, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I tell you, when you're going through it, I, you understand that scripture better. When you feel like you're all alone, I, you're in the bottom of that well, I, you're in that fiery furnace, when you're in that lion's den, I, then you realize Jesus I, is there with me. I, he told me he'd never leave me, I, and I know that he's going to do what he said. When we go through the trials, they're precious because we're reminded that even our valleys are planned by the Lord. He said in Romans 8 and 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. We're reminded that our trials are helping us to grow in the Lord. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 and 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We're reminded through the trials that something better is waiting on us. He said in Romans 8 and 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We're reminded and trials are precious because through those trials, that even when times seem bad, uh, we can testify that God is still good. 
The Bible said in Job 1, 20 and 21, Then Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm telling you, going through the trials that we face, they can be difficult, they can be hard, but when we come forth on the other side, I'm telling you, we're able to know the Lord better, we're able to be stronger in. God. God is glorified as we remember his word. We remember his promises and we're stronger in our faith than before we went in the trial. So the next time things get hard, we ought to thank God for this precious trial that God's still working on me. Somebody say man, Hallelujah to God. I'm going to be stronger when I come out of this thing. I'm going to be stronger when this trial is over. It's going to cause us again to remember the promises of his word. It's going to cause me again to recognize that he is God and God alone. And only God can get me through this trial. We're able to learn things about God the trials of our faith that otherwise we'd never known about him you can hear somebody talk about the things that God does for other people but until we go through it ourselves is when we really learn about who God who God is come on sister Albright the trials of our faith cause us to learn and grow and develop and mature and be able to understand God better than before we go through them. The disciples would have never known that Jesus could walk on the water if there hadn't been a storm first, Sister Diane. If, if there hadn't been a storm arose, that, that terrible storm, they would have never known that he could have the power to walk on the waters and to come to where they were. They had to go through that trial to learn that about Jesus. He's got power. Even in the great storms of life, he'll walk out to where I am no matter what the storm is. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have never known that God can take the heat out of a fire if they hadn't first been thrown in the fiery furnace. They'd have never known that his God's got the power to take the heat out of the flame and turn the air condition on in a fiery trial. Noah would have never known that God could keep him safe in the ark if there hadn't been a flood arose in that day. Mary and Martha would have never known that Jesus could raise the dead if Lazarus hadn't died first. Those 5,000, not counting women and children, would have never known that Jesus could take just five loaves and two fishes uh, and feed everybody on that hillside that day uh, if they hadn't become hungry uh, and needed food. Can you say amen? What I'm telling you is this. Our trials show us a side of God uh, that otherwise we might have never known about this God. Sister Blanche, may have never known that God can walk into a hospital room in Greensboro. Was that, where was that, Greensboro? Was it Greensboro or Winston? Greensboro. Uh, Greensboro. Sister Blanche may have never known personally that God can walk into a hospital room in Greensboro and touch her and take her off life support if she hadn't got sick and nearly died. Some of us may have never known that God can make ways financially where there are no ways if we hadn't run out of money before we ran out of month. We might have never known that God can heal sickness if we hadn't first got sick in our bodies, but then God touch us and heal us. Is that right, Brother Dean? The trials of our life, the trials of our faith are sent to us not to hurt us, not to cause us to get discouraged and just quit, but they're sent to us to cause us to trust Him and know that His promises are true and to know things about God, the things that God can do that otherwise we'd only read about in His Word. But now I know by experience that God can do anything 
Can you raise your hands and give him praise today? Hallelujah. So, I'm going to say something that only the spiritual minded man or woman can understand and can nod their head in agreement and say amen to thank God for our trials. Thank God for our trials. You're not going to get a carnal minded person to agree with that. They don't understand that. To the world, that seems backwards. That seems strange. But Peter said that this trying of your faith is of more value than gold that's going to perish. Because this faith in God is going to get us to heaven. This faith in God is going to keep our soul for eternity with Him. You take any, just, just about anybody on this earth, even some church folks, you put a pile of money right there. You put a million dollars sitting right there. And on this side, you tell them you can have that. Or you can have heartaches. You can have suffering. You can have hardships. You can have fiery furnaces and lion's dens and giants. And I tell you, the line over here is going to be short. Most people are going to line up for this over here. But he said all of this is going to perish. All of this is going to go away. All of this has no real eternal value but your faith in God. These tests and these trials and these hardships, these things are what's going to form you. These are the things that are going to grow you. These are the things that are going to help you secure you. These are the things that are going to stand the test. These are the things that when you come through them are going to cause you to shine like real gold that will last forever and forever. Can you say amen? Will you stand with me today? Peter said they're of great value. Learning ground. Testing ground is learning ground where we grow, where we develop. Sometimes when we go through trials, and we all do, we all go through them. Most of us could probably take this microphone this morning and tell the church of what you're facing right now, what you're dealing with. Sometimes I remind us when I go through a trial, a difficulty, I remember the last one. And how God got me through that trial. Sometimes, I don't know how it is for you, but sometimes I just shake my head. I know He's God. I know He can do anything, but sometimes I'm still just baffled at what He does and how He does it. I don't believe that shows a lack of faith on your part or mine. I believe He's just an amazing God. He just does things His way at times. It just calls us to... I can't hardly grasp how He does things sometimes. I can't hardly grasp the way He's able to do things. Even though I know that He can. It's still amazing. So the last trial that you came forth out of safely should cause you to be stronger for this trial. Because you know what God yet did yesterday for you. He'll do it again today for you. And whatever we face tomorrow, He'll be there to see us safely through. Peter said our trials are valuable to us. They're precious because of what they do in us and through us. And how they develop us. We need... I'm not against new church buildings and all that. I, I'm thankful for this. I'm, we, got a, we have a beautiful sanctuary. We're blessed. I, I'm thankful for that. But I'd rather have to have church outside without a building than have a church full of faith that we could believe God than to have a glass cathedral with, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people but no faith. My 
My grandparents, my grandfather, going to be with the Lord now. I may or may not have shared this with you, but when he was a young preacher, back then they had brush harbor meetings. Anybody remember those brush harbors? They would meet in people's homes and have church. They had tent services, outdoor services. And uh, he got invited to preach in somebody's home one night. And they had enough money, gas, to get them down there, but not get them back home. Got enough gas to get there. Got to work the rest of the week. Got to have gas to go to work. Got kids. The kids were small. What do you do? My grandpa said, we're going. It's not a supply. Drove down there. Had service that night. I believe his dad, if I'm not mistaken, I believe his dad was in that service. My grandpa's dad came and heard him preach that night. I don't know if he got saved or not. I don't remember, but I believe my, his dad was there. After the service was over, shook hands, got back in their car to leave, to go home. Don't have enough gas to get home. What do you do? Right before they started to back out, this lady come out the door and said, Hang on, Brother Shelton, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He didn't tell nobody. You know, I stand up in, in, in church and tell people, I, I know God's going to work it out, but I got a bill for $679.12. I know God's going to make a way somehow, but I don't have it. I know God's going to work it out. I wish we'd take up an offering for it. She said, wait a minute, Brother Shelton. God just told me to give you this. Not only was enough money to get them gas to get them home, it was enough money to get them gas the rest of the week for work. Also enough money to get them grocery money for that week. Faith. Believe in God for what seems impossible with us. We need a bumper crop of faith today. We need a harvest of faith in the church that would cause us to believe God. Every head bow and every eye closed, please. I wrestle with this message. But I believe I preach what God laid on my heart. I believe I have. If you're here today and you say, Brother Shelton, I'm going through a trial. I, I believe we're all saved here. If you're not, these orders are open for you to come. You can be saved today. I, I believe I'm among Christian people. If you're not saved. You're not certain. You don't have to wonder. You can have a no so salvation. I know that I'm ready for heaven. If you're not saved, these orders are open for you to come this morning. You can be saved today. If you're here and you say, Brother Shelton, I'm in a trial right now. I'm going through a test right now. I am not going to let this thing stop me. I am not going to let this thing hinder me. I am not going to let this thing cause me to deny God, denounce God, turn my back on God. I'm not going to let it cause me to quit or slow me down. But I need the Lord to touch me this morning. Help me through this trial. If that's you, these altars are open for you right now. You can come and pray and talk to him. Sister Shelton, I've been through some things in the ministry. Oh, dear God, we could write a book about it, Brother Mike. But I've said it before, those things that don't kill us, they make us stronger. We've been through some hardships and trials and tests. God's always been faithful just like he has for you. You've been through hardships and tests and trials. Some of you in this house, I know personally, you've been through some sore trials. I've been there when your heart was broken, you weep till you couldn't, you couldn't control it. I've been there when your families tore your heart out, your children tore your heart out. I've been there with some of you when you were so sick, death was a welcome thing. But God got you through. Hallelujah. God got you through, and here you are today, still serving Him. 
still living for him. Precious trials. Because they've helped make you what you are in him. They put some concrete in your spine. They've made you stand when you should have fallen, when you should have been knocked down, but they've caused you to stand. And you've carried on for God. Anybody else here, you say, I need the Lord to touch me today. I appreciate these and these elders. These are Christian people. But you need the Lord to touch you this morning. You need the Lord to help you. Come on right now. These altars are open. You can make an altar right there where you're at. But you need God to touch you today. Peter said, this trial, this thing that you're dealing with, it's a precious thing. It is a precious thing. I want some of you others to come, if you would, and let's pray with these in the altars today. He said, no testing, no trial for the moment. It seems pleasant. It doesn't seem pleasant when you're going through it, I can tell you. It's hard at times, isn't it? It's hard to go through some of the things that you've gone through. It's not been easy. He never said the way it would be easy. But he said he'd be with us in the way. Some of you have been through some hard things. But God's been faithful to you and God's helped you. You're able to be in this service this morning, able to be here today because He's an unchanging God. You kept your faith in Him. Father, we thank You this morning for the privilege of coming to church. I thank You for the joy of salvation. I thank You for this congregation here today. Lord, those that have been here, those that have watched online, those that will watch online later. I pray for them. I pray for each and every one. We thank you, Lord, for the difficult seasons. We thank you for the night season, the midnight hours that we go through. You said that in those night seasons, even then, you'll give us songs to sing. And that joy always comes in the morning. We thank you, Lord, for every, every trial that you brought us through. In our time on this earth, our brief time on this earth. Sometimes those trials seem like they're never going to end. Sometimes they seem like a lifetime. But I'm glad you've been faithful to us, Lord. You've kept us and you've helped us. And you've promised to continue to. I pray for these in the elders, these on the pews today. I pray that whatever we face, whatever the day brings, that we'll keep our trust in you, Lord. We'll keep our integrity. We'll maintain a godly character. We'll continue to live righteously and holy. And we'll walk on by faith in you. We'll trust you. As Job said, though he trusts me, though he slay me, yet will I trust him, yet will I serve him. Increase our faith today. Make us strong in the Lord and the power of your mind. Save our lost loved ones. Help us to keep on believing. Just as you told Jairus, even after the news came that his daughter was dead, they said it's too late now. You said to Jairus, just believe or keep on believing, Jairus. 
Keep on believing. You raise that little 12 year old girl from the dead. Help us to keep on believing, God. No matter what it looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like, help us to have faith in God, to keep on believing your word, to keep on living by faith. The just shall live by faith. You said to have faith in God. Increase our faith today, Lord. Help us to trust you more, to believe your word, to live by faith. Let our children see it, our co-workers see it, our neighbors see it. Those out in that world, let them see that we, no matter what happens, we don't have to fall apart, have nervous breakdowns, go all to pieces. Stock market can crash today. If we know you're going to take care of us. This country can go bankrupt today. Lose our jobs tomorrow. But you promise that you'll supply every need for us. We can trust you through it all. Give us that kind of faith today, Lord. Help us to walk in that kind of integrity, that kind of faith. Let the world know there is a God. There is a Savior. There is a Helper. That you never fail. That you cannot fail us. I thank you for loving us. I thank you for helping us. I thank you that we're saved by grace and we're secured by grace. We're kept by grace. these prayers today, God. Meet these needs today. Touch and heal today in Jesus' name.